Hey, this is Pastor Curry, pastor of the Easy and Fair Baptist Church, Wilmington's most exciting church, the church that love ya and ain't a thing you can do about it. Today with Coffee with Curry, we're going to continue that whole series of having conversations and talking about gratitude and being grateful during this month of November. What are you grateful for? What have you called those individuals who you feel are somewhat um, not on your top priority, but you really do need to call them? This month, we were just trying our best to just share various people and things that we are grateful for. We talked about the Lord and we had our ministers on and how grateful we are for what the Lord has done for us. Today, I'm grateful to have a friend and I wanted to bring in one of my dear friends who is certainly true and to his calling and true to himself. So today we got Dr. Bill Curtis, who's going to be with us. And I'm hoping and trusting that you would call somebody, tell him Coffee with Curry is on and let's get after it. Good morning, Delaware and surrounding areas. You are now tuned in to this week's Coffee with Curry. Join us every Sunday at 11 a.m with new guests every week. So grab your cup of coffee and join us on Coffee with Curry. And we're back. Well, as I promised on the front end of the show that we were going to have a good friend, uh, Dr. Bill uh, Curtis from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Want to give you a pre-warning that he is a member of the fr greatest fraternity in the world, uh, which is Omega Psi Phi Fraternity. Here with us today, he is celebrating our men's week. And I thought since he would be here, that this would be a great opportunity to have a conversation with him. Dr. Curtis, welcome to the show. Thank you, my friend. Rude to the cues. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to spend some time with you today because during this whole month, We've just been talking about gratitude. We're grateful. And we opened up the month by talking with one of our ministers, or really two of our ministers who we, we used as scripture, in all things and for all things, give thanks. And we just kind of exegeted it to the best of our ability. Um, but today I'm just grateful that you're here because you are the epitome of an individual who can start behind but jump in front. Mm. And I don't know whether it was a jump, but you are in front now. And I wanted to spend some time with you and just talk about it. So how I want to start off our conversation today is to really talk about um, your trajectory. You know, how, how was it being little Bill in the house? Just tell us a little bit about you. That's interesting that you talk about jumping ahead. So I am the product of a split family. Okay. My parents divorced when I was 15. I can still remember the trauma of listening to them had that final conversation that eventuated in the Saturday morning, <clears throat> us being told to pack our bags. We then spent two weeks at my maternal grandmother's house mm -hmm. while my mother decided where she was going to settle. Mm -hmm. I remember watching my father stand on the front porch and cry as we were driving off in the only car they shared. Mm -hmm. And then watching my father hit rock bottom and have to rebuild to have some semblance of normalcy of life. So I can still remember those traumatic events. We went to my grandmother's house for two weeks. We settled into a, um, an apartment for a little while and then went into what I guess back then would have been considered in modern lingo, a condominium. Okay. But it was in a rough part of the city okay. of Baltimore. And I did the rest of high school. I struggled my way through Morgan State, not academically, but I struggled mm -hmm. financially, trying okay. to find the money to pay for tuition and mm -hmm. the like. And then at age 15, I wrestled with that call to ministry. Mm. I went to New Psalmist singing on a gospel choir mm. a Thursday night. I'll never forget it. And I was enamored by then Dr. Walter Thomas, how cool he was, mm. how articulate he was, how masterful with language he was. He had these long sideburns, three-piece suit. Mm. And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, if that's what a professional clergy mm. person looks like, and I'm wrestling with a call to ministry, that's the kind of professional I want to be. Wow. So I joined that Thursday night. Oh, wow. Went back. My girlfriend happened to be going there at the same time. Okay. I went back uh, really on Sunday sitting with her. And to hear Bishop Thomas tell it, I would sit on the end of that row right side from the pulpit as one of the most inquisitive young adults he had ever <laughs> seen. 
and he invited me into a small cell group. Mm -hmm. And from that small cell group, four out of the five of us mm -hmm. ended up delivering our initial sermons. Wow. I did that at 17, and maybe a couple of months later, he brought me on staff. Excellent. Yep. And then once I went on staff, I served with him until I was 22. Mm -hmm. And then I took my first church. Wow. You know, and I just want to back up a little bit. And you, so for those of you who are watching, uh, uh, Pastor, we, when you were talking about Walter Scott Thomas, um, what a giant, mm -hmm. what a great man. But I love the way you 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 couched him as an individual as being cool. Mm -hmm. um, he was somebody you could look up to. Mm -hmm. um, not that you never had a father in your life, but you saw what a father in ministry would look like and would encourage you. Um, today he's doing very well. Mm -hmm. What you said you you sure your girlfriend wasn't your purpose for going there, or was it really? Make no mistake about it. Her <laughs> mother allowed me to go over their house after church on Sunday for their Sunday dinner. Okay. But the only way I could show up for dinner is that I went to church. Okay. So it was kind of that, what they call that double entendre, right? Yeah. Go to church, you get to spend time with your girlfriend yeah. in the afternoon, yeah. you get to hang out at yeah. their house uh, after the benediction. And then she would let me stay till that sun started going down. And as soon as that sun started going down, I hear these words. Tina, when that boy going home? I got you. And I knew that was exit stage left. Well, you know, it's really interesting that you even, we're living in such a different time. That just sounds fun. You're right. I mean, you're you you, you you're able to go to church, even though that wasn't on your agenda in the yeah. front end, but your girlfriend went and you were able to go there, go to dinner, be over her family house. What was that type, what, how was life in the inner city for you? So for me, it was uh, it was kind of rough. You know, everything centered around sports. Okay. If you didn't play a sport, you mm -hmm. probably were going to slide into something that was going to land you incarcerated, mm -hmm. drug addicted, mm -hmm. or you were going to be terminated. I got you. I played basketball. Mm -hmm. And in our neighborhood, I started out playing baseball, but in our neighborhood, basketball dominated. Mm -hmm. I played basketball, and I was relatively good. I was never good enough for a college scholarship, but I was always good enough for street cred. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference. Absolutely. You know? In fact, I was softly recruited for Community College of Baltimore, which was a junior college in the city. And the only way that I ended up at Morgan was that the day before I was about to sign to go into the United States Marine Corps, mm -hmm. and it was my intention to do a career in the military. My father was a Navy man. Mm -hmm. So I was going to do a whole career in the Marine Corps. I liked the uniforms. I wanted somebody else to pay for my education, and I wanted to travel. Mm -hmm. And I knew the only way to escape what were the horrors of inner city Baltimore mm -hmm. was to perhaps go into the military. We didn't have money to send me to school. But I had an aunt who was the procurement officer at Morgan State University. Mm -hmm. And she did all the back paperwork mm -hmm. to apply for what back then was a senatorial scholarship. Right. She applied for that and somehow I got it. Right. 24 hours before I was going to sign for a career in the United States Marine Corps, my Aunt Miriam called me and said, you're going to Morgan State. Excellent. So I ended up at Morgan. I declared a major originally in computer science. Okay. And between freshman and sophomore year was when I was wrestling with that call. Okay. And when I preached my initial sermon, I then subsequently changed the major to religious studies and philosophy. Okay. And the rest was kind of how that trajectory got started. Yeah. Great, great, great black HBCU experience and how uh, even with your aunt even though she, we had aunts who weren't our aunts right. who looked out for us in those hbcus but i like the way you you you, you so you changed your major mm -hmm. after you really felt the russell was over you you're gonna you're gonna move forward with uh the ministry do you have any professors that you can remember who also helped you with that trajectory both on the positive and the negative side okay, let's hear it so herb edwards was the dean of the religious department at morgan at the time mm -hmm. i think he was a united methodist okay. pastor and minister and he was a great balance between philosophy and religion mm -hmm. and he knew how to just speak the common language mm -hmm. Now, undergrad study of religion is certainly more of an overview, right. more cursory than the intensity of seminary, mm -hmm. but he made it intense enough mm -hmm. that you really did feel like you were getting a seminary education. Mm -hmm. It solidified the call. It gave you an understanding of Old and New Testament, church history, 
but he also was very into prophetic ministry. Okay. Because he was a, a advocate for the civil rights. He was on the front line of the marches. He had done so much advocacy work on behalf of African Americans in the inner city of Baltimore. So he also kind of instilled into us that Afrocentric lens okay. as we sought to interpret scripture. And he was the one, along with the fact that my pastor had graduated from Howard, he and Bishop Thomas were kind of the encouragers for me to go from Morgan to Howard University okay, to pursue the MDiv there. So, but, and on the negative side, I had an English professor and I remember Miss Britton as if she were here talking to me today. Mm. And I remember her looking at me one day and saying, young Mr. Curtis, I don't know if you have the academic mm. wherewithal to finish an undergrad degree. Now she meant that as a way to kind of push me out because right. I was not a great student okay. the first year and a half, but I saw it as com a competitive thing. Right. And as soon as she said that for me, it was game on. Right. If you don't think I can compete here, not only am I going to compete, I'm going to excel. Right. So from that negativity, it just propelled me to really make my undergrad education something that I could be proud of when I graduated. Mm. So I went from a 2.9 mm. first semester GPA and graduated with a 3.7. Yeah, well, that's good to know you had a 2.9 first semester because I can't testify to that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be very honest with you. I, I think I had a, 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 Lord, help me get back to school. Uh, great point. I, that freedom just messed up for me. I just went wild and crazy, but that's excellent. Uh, you know, Doc, um, you, you, you spoke of the good experience with... Um, both of those experiences were at Morgan, am I correct? Right. And then you also talked about the transition of you being able to be influenced by your pastor to go to Howard. Mm -hmm. um, of all the preachers in this country, I always thought that Dr. Thomas didn't yet get the credit mm -hmm. that he deserved when it comes down to his mind. He was a very brilliant and still is a uh, 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 pastor and preacher and, and, and theologian. Um, what, what, what experiences did you have at Howard? That, that kept you motivated because you even left there and got your doctoral degree as well. So what were some things that went on in, at Howard? Well, I went to Howard and we, we would brag, those of us who graduated back in those mm -hmm. days, we bragged that that was probably their best years as a seminary. Okay. Okay. We had Kane Hope Felder as a new oh. professor. We had uh, Ilias Farahaja J. Jones, a name that most people would not know. Right but he was the preeminent scholar on Afrocentricity and understanding Coptic religion mm -hmm. back in those days. I had Calvin um, Miller, I believe was his last name, who was a systematic theology professor. Cartwright Davis, who was a noted and reputable scholar in systematic theology. Dolores Carpenter, who was in uh, Christian education. These were the preeminent scholars at the time. Right, right. They were competing in terms of ranking with Union in New York, Virginia Union in Richmond, but everybody wanted to come to Howard at that time. Right. I ended up being asked to be the student assistant for Kane Felder. Okay. And he had just written Troubling Biblical Waters. Right. And then subsequent to that, Stony the Road We Tried. Mm. So he was on the circuit introducing people to the Afrocentric lens for reading the New Testament. Mm -hmm. We became so enamored with him and so curious and inquisitive about his angle, mm -hmm. his lens. And you know, the only other person at the time who was a scholar that was drawing um, theological attention was out of union, and that would have been James Cone. Oh, Cone, okay. And a lot of his disciples were now dispersing. So Kelly Brown Douglas became a systematic theologian mm -hmm. on residence at Howard Divinity School and the like. So it was the heyday. Mm -hmm. So going there was where I started really understanding that everything I was learning was going to be the foundation for pastoral ministry, mm -hmm. community development. And they actually started stirring in me the hunger to consider working in academia. Okay. I would have never considered going back, you know, later to United mm -hmm. to raise and mentor DMIN students if it had not been for my experience at Howard. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm listening to you carefully, and, and it, a lot, there are a lot of young people who do watch our show. And one of the things I would like to, to you to do for us is just 
your experience at the HBCU is, was very important. But before I ask that question, are you a first generation um, college grad? I am. Okay. And I had to ask that before I assumed. Mm -hmm. People don't understand that those first generational children tend to really appreciate their education. And the HBCUs were the really the only places we can go and be somebody, but really get a true education. Yeah, it was not only that, but see, you know, my parents couldn't afford to send me. Mm -hmm. So while I was finishing up Morgan, mm -hmm. Walter Thomas, mm -hmm. unbeknownst to me at the time, called several of his colleagues mm -hmm. and said, I got a guy who needs to finish. Mm -hmm. And they, as angel investors, paid for my last four semesters. Wow. I would go to put some money on my account only to discover that my tuition had been completed for the semester. Wow. And I never knew how it was completed. Only after I graduated did Dr. Thomas then tell me who they were so that I could write thank you letters, go and shake hands mm -hmm. and have conversations with them. And there were about four to six pastors and included in that were two members of New Psalmist who had done very well in their medical fields. Mm -hmm. They literally financed wow. the second half of my undergrad degree. So I kind of felt like I owed them. Right. I owed them not only graduating, mm -hmm. I owed them my best effort. Okay. Because aside from that, I don't know if I ever would have continued w to what became the obtaining of the D-Man. Yeah. Think about it. You talked about the black school, the black church. Mm -hmm really framed you, mm -hmm. really helped you. Saved my life. Yeah, thank you, and saved your life. Yep. Um, sometimes here in the city of Wilmington, I, I make comments, because I'm from that same background, first generation uh, college uh, graduate, um, and it, and, but the, it was interesting, my church didn't have money. You know, doc, Dr. Thomas, he, he, he's, a, he's a brilliant scholar, he went to school, did well for himself. Mm -hmm. My church didn't have money, so what they would do is they would raise money to allow us it wasn't just me, it was a couple of us right. to get through college. But it was something that the president of Lincoln, who just went home to be with the Lord about a year and a half ago, Dr. Nira Sudarkasa, who was the first woman president of Lincoln, um, she felt that there was something in me worth investing in. Mm -hmm. The president of the university then paid for my master's degree. And that was her gift to me. Right. And I was one of her thorns. But going to a HBCU, I don't think we're ever thorns to them. They help develop us to make us who we are. I think they see the rough edge mm. of diamonds mm -hmm. that only need to be crafted and handled in certain ways. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't negate the fact that they observe a diamond. I got you. Right. And, yeah. and I think some of those elders, this is why I'm always trying to cross pollinate mm -hmm. those who are seniors in the community and in the church with those who are younger. And we've lost a lot of that, particularly with technology and the like, there's more separation than there is synergy and congruence. But the reason that that's so important is because we understand at this stage that a 17 or 18 or 19 year old is gonna come at us a certain way. Right. They're gonna have a certain mindset about mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be a little rebellious. Mm -hmm. They're gonna have a certain bend towards an opinion and all, we understand that, but that doesn't negate the discernment for potential. Gotcha. And where you see potential, you make the extra investment, right? Right. You handle the rough edge. You handle the fact that they're going to be verbose and their opinions are going to be without lack of mature knowledge. You just, you write that off because you know years, maturation, exposure, education is going to help to smooth out those rough edges. Right. And that's what people did for me. And, who, and we're going to go to a commercial break, but I want to just share this because, you know, Tony Allen is from Delaware, and I wanted to just bring him up uh, because you just last year was, was the keynote speaker yeah. for the prayer breakfast. But he shared a testimony of how during the pandemic, you and your ministry kind of kept him stable. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought... You know, old uh, city boy uh, would have such an influence over even a major university college president. Yeah. But what blew my mind was while we were in revival here at East Zion Fair, uh, a young lady, uh, I think her name is Panji, she did her dissertation. You didn't even, I don't, th no, I don't think you remembered her because you have a lot of members and, I, and we'll talk about that later. But she put you in her dissertation and said verbally to you, mm -hmm. you saved my life. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's humbling. It's humbling. Yeah. But for you and I, we know this. We know ultimately it's God's ministry. Mm -hmm. 
and we know that the gift really belongs to him. Mm -hmm. We steward it. We don't own it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, while folk give us the thanks, mm -hmm. we all, we ultimately know who gets glory. Absolutely. Right? And I think um, that's why the Bible spends so much time talking about humility. Yeah. I think that's why Paul says there was given unto me this thorn in the flesh right. to keep me from becoming right. conceited because right. the ministry can be an ego mm. builder, mm -hmm. but it can also, if not manage right, it can be an ego destroyer. Right. Yes. So, you know, ultimately, while I, I am uh, grateful mm -hmm. for the expressions of thanks. The moment I get back to a private space of solitude, I'm like, God, thank you. I, I had no idea that I would be privileged to steward the mystery in a way that would impact people's lives who in our community we consider to be change agents and influencing people. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just the most humbling thing. Amen. The other side of it is though, it, it helps you understand that our job is to invest in people mm -hmm. for their future, mm -hmm. but we don't own people. Amen. So I don't expect Amen. any member to ever come back and express thanks to me. Mm -hmm. It's it's my privilege to be able to serve the kingdom, right? Yeah. I had no idea I was in Pangie's dissertation, yeah. no idea the impact upon her life. And when I hear expressions like that, it just makes me ultimately think this still is God's church, right? Amen. And and what was funny to me is that you her dissertation dealt with toxicology. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that was interesting. We're going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to come back. And I want to talk to you a little bit about your first uh, call, your first okay. assignment uh, as a pastor and how that was and how the transition was because we have some pastors who watch the show and just for those who are young and, and looking forward to it we'll be right back okay. i am thankful for the friends that i've made family i'm thankful for my parents and my brothers for supporting me in everything i do I'm thankful for my strong support system of friends and family who have stood by me for every decision I've made and I know that they will continue to stand by me through all my future decisions. I'm thankful for my siblings for always supporting me. This holiday season I'm thankful for the gift of music and how much joy and fun it brings. I've loved music for a long time. It's so much fun. I feel like everyone needs music in their life. Like It's a necessity. I'm thankful for the student athletes at DUville and my coworkers. Uh, this holiday season, I am thankful for my family and my friends. I am so thankful for the health of my family. I'm so thankful for the hard work of our students. They inspire me every day. And I'm very thankful for the graduates that extol the virtues of this institution. I am thankful for the gift of life and the opportunity to spend unlimited quality time with family and friends this holiday season. I'm thankful for everyone taking the time to serve those most in need this Thanksgiving. On behalf of everyone at DeUville, Happy Thanksgiving. Join us at 9 a.m. on Facebook Live every Sunday by typing Ezion Fair Baptist Church. Seth, Jesus felt what you're feeling, but he did not see it. Am I in the word? one who has who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet he did not sin we are Wilmington's most exciting church And we're back. Great conversation. Great understanding. And you know, uh, Brother Curtis, I, 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 I knew. I thought I knew you, but I, I'm really learning way more now. And just for those of you who are watching, you know, I served. Many of you know I served as Grand Chaplain for Omega Psi Phi. A part of my success, a huge part of my success, came at the hands of this brother who introduced me to other brothers who could help with some of the things that we were trying to do. And I don't care when I called, as long as we had a good golf course, uh, he, he would show up 
and just make things happen for us all. I, I'm grateful. This this is the whole purpose of the show today is to make sure that we are sharing the great gratitude. But let's talk a little bit about your first call. You you gave us enough, uh, not enough, but a lot of one, you know, going through seminary, being trained, which really your pastor said something to me that I want to just say your example of uh, of what what uh uh, he was very much talking about don't have a lot of burning without any learning um, where you got the learning and you learned what you need to learn. But you had two callings. But let's talk about the first one. So Walter Thomas, his uh, ideology for ministry back in the day was the church is the center of the community. OK. And activity mm -hmm. is key. Mm -hmm. So if you were on staff there, you had to teach a Bible study during the week. You had to be present for worship on the weekend. And I was in charge of community of the uh, community property developments. Okay. So I managed the rental properties. I had to uh, do all the installs and maintenance on our pieces of equipment, mm -hmm. technology. I actually was the person who changed them from word-based computers to Macintosh. Yeah, sure. yeah. Back in the day, that's what they call it, Macintosh. Yeah. Okay. Because that was the background out of which I was coming. And that was the career trajectory I was heading towards. Mm -hmm. So his hook into me was, I know you went to Morgan to study computers, come on staff and get us up to speed, outfit us the way we need to for mm -hmm. the future. So he had me teaching a Tuesday night Bible study. Mm -hmm. In there was an uh, older gentleman, Tyrone Bernard, who would end up becoming a minister himself long after I'd left. And he was from York, Pennsylvania. Mm. He had gone home to see his family and they told him there was a vacancy in the pulpit of Shiloh Baptist Church. They needed somebody just really to kind of fill the pulpit for a while. And he said, oh, you should get my discipleship instructor. Mm -hmm. So he brokered the call. I went up a couple of times to preach and a couple of months later, and I'm 21 at the time. Oh, wow. A couple of months later, they asked me if I would candidate. I didn't fully understand what that meant, but I talked to Dr. Thomas and he said, oh yeah, try it. You know, if nothing else, going through the process mm -hmm. is pedagogical. It'll teach you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I preach, I do a Bible study, I have an interview and I have a session with the church. And then I was surprised they called me. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm 22. I literally had just gotten married okay. a couple of months before. Mm -hmm. My wife was finishing up her master's degree in human resource development. And we were both like, we're going to York, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so you talk about like walking by faith, like I'd never heard of York. Who had ever heard of York, right? So I got there and um, I spent seven years pastoring that church. It was a very blue collar city. Mm -hmm. And it could not have been a better first call for me because I had to work that mm. ministry. I would have Bible study where one Wednesday it'd be 50 people. And then all of them would transition from first shift to third shift. Mm. And I'd go back the next Wednesday and there'd be two people sitting in there. Mm. Um, I was the only educated, degreed clergy person out of 32 churches in the entire city. Wow. So what it did for me was it set me up to be further mentored by some very key people in the city. Mm -hmm. Back then they had the Community Reinvestment Act. Okay. I think that's what they called it. Yeah. So people like Bob Pullo, who was the president of York Federal Savings and Loan, later to become Harris Bank, he put me on his board. Wow. Memorial Hospital, when they needed to have African-American presence, put me on their board. So between 22 and 30, I am serving on boards that people politic for now. Mm -hmm. I went on a board that uh, worked with urban development, redevelopment, the Urban Redevelopment Authority, mm -hmm. and it taught me how people downtown think about how to grow cities and how to merge corporate and academic with mm -hmm. neighborhoods. And I was mentored by people. Interesting little side bit, the current governor who's about to go out in the state of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf, mm -hmm. he and I worked out mm -hmm. at Crispus Attic's basement mm -hmm. gym in York, Pennsylvania. Wow. Never knowing years later that he would follow a political trajectory. He was a, a, um, a multi-generational family member running a business, a very lucrative mm -hmm. business in York. Mm -hmm. He had no political ambitions back then. Who would ever know that he would become governor, that I would be in Pittsburgh pastoring, and on his campaign trail, we would reunite as he was stomping around the state of Pennsylvania to run and walk into Mount Ararat, and much to his surprise, 
the guy that he was working out with between 22 and 30 was now pastoring wow. a mega church in Pittsburgh. Okay. And we ended up reconnecting and doing great things, not only for Ararat and our footprint, but for the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought, you're talking about humbling, who would have thought that the African-American pastor of Mount Ararat would be key even to the success of our county executive, our mayor, mm -hmm. and the things that corporate giants wanted to do in the city of Pittsburgh. I started getting calls like, Hey, Reverend Curtis, can you call the governor for me <laughs> from corporate CEO? Yeah. When the county executive saw me at the Democratic National Convention, he comes over and he says, how did you get here? Mm. Well, I was invited by the governor. And you're talking about a shift of right, right. perception of power. Right. So that's kind of how York was for me. I finished my seminary degree there. Um, my daughter was born mm -hmm. in York. I drove her by York Hospital to show her the exact department mm. where uh, she emerged into the world. I went on um, staff at York County College. So before age 30, I was an adjunct professor teaching world religions wow. there. Okay. And part of that was because sometimes it's better to be an average fish in a small pond yes. than to run out here trying to be yes. a big fish okay. in a big pond That's right. only to expose That's that you're right. really a small fish. There you go. Yeah. You know, and I failed to talk about your daughter who's doing exceptionally well and your wife. So I do want to throw that in there because you know one thing about the bros, we, we, right. we, everybody want us. So, I mean, what y'all, <laughs> not us, y'all. Uh, but I want to make sure that you didn't know that you have a wife and, and talk a little bit about that, but your daughter as well. I, because I'm just impressed with how the Lord blessed her to do, she's doing some great things with her uh, and her academics. Mm -hmm. So let, let and then I'll come back to the second calling. Let's talk a little bit about one, your wife, and then let's share something about the daughter. So as I mentioned, I met my wife singing okay. on the gospel. So it's the same woman? Yeah. Okay, you oh, only yeah. had one girlfriend. We, date, we, we mm -hmm. dated when I was 15. Oh, wow. So I married <laughs> my literal high like, school sweetheart. Right. We sang on a gospel choir Okay. and ended up dating. Mm -hmm ended up getting married mm -hmm. and Houston was born six years after uh, we got married and I think I mentioned my wife has a master's degree in human resource development but we were in a city where we had no family mm -hmm. and I can still remember the conversation after maternity leave when she comes back and says I'm not going back to work mm. I'm gonna make the sacrifice and stay home and I'll be the principal parent to raise our daughter and the rest, you know, kind of fell on me. Th this is where couples have to negotiate and have cr crucial conversations. We develop a stair uh, climbing method. Okay. We sat down one day and figured out it was probably easier, quicker, and better for me to get my master's first because it was my career that took us to York. Mm -hmm. And then when I finished my master's, the negotiation was then I would pause she would get hers, I would go get my doctorate, we would pause, and then she would obtain whatever other degree she needed. Well, after the MDiv, she decided she was gonna stay home and be a homemaker. I went back and got the D-men, and that's what propelled me to be on the radar screen for Pittsburgh. Oh, wow. And I tell my church to this day, I am a great father, mm -hmm. but my job was made all the more easy because my wife is a perfect mother. Excellent. She sacrificed career, mm -hmm. and she stayed home turning down really heavy wage earning potential mm -hmm. to be there to make sure drop-offs and pickups and homework was checked. And I tried to do what I could, mm -hmm. you know, when I was there. But I tell anybody, Houston Curtis is the product of Christine Curtis's full-time attention. Wow. And that's, you know, it's weird because I, I I wanted to just talk about what we are grateful for, although we still are, but you've given us a lot of nuggets, a lot of nuggets. And I hope those of you who are watching us today are paying close attention. Um, this marital thing is very important. Mm -hmm. Who you marry matters. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't hear that y'all wouldn't compete uh, competed against each other. I didn't hear that. I heard that she, she there was a point where Y'all have a child now, mm -hmm. and and she made a decision, yep. and 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 because it was your career that brought you to 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 um uh, to York, mm -hmm. and 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 I just I appreciate that I yep. appreciate that very much. So so you you you're there um with, with with your wife who has done a phenomenal job, but let's talk a little bit about Houston. Yeah, this really is a story about the black church. Okay, so I pastor 
what I consider to be a great church, not because of the attendance, not because of the worship, not because of the outreach impact. One of the reasons that Arid is great is because they gave us freedom to be ourselves and how we parented our daughter. Okay. We were not the family where Houston had to be there for everything. Okay. Front and center. Amen. Under a lot of pressure, uh -huh. under the scope all the uh -huh. time. Uh -huh. Everybody understood. Uh -huh. She moves and matriculates around here as a simple youth connected yes. to other youth. Yes. Don't say anything twisted to her. Mm -hmm. I am a bruh. Uh -huh. I'm a black man, uh -huh. and I'm very protective of my daughter. Amen. And you will see another side of me. Absolutely. And Ararat was wonderful okay. in letting Houston integrate into okay. the life of the church with no additional pressure. Excellent. The only reason I start with that is because she served as one of the camp mentors for years, mm -hmm. fell in love with working with kids. Mm -hmm. She, as a, a early teenager, told me she was going to be a pediatrician. Wow. I'm talking like 12, 13. Okay. You know, and you write it off. I don't have any medical stuff in my background. My wife didn't. I'm technological. My wife is psychological. And, you know, so we, but we didn't kill the dream. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When she graduated from high school, she went to Villanova. Right. And when she got to Villanova and said she was going to start out with medicine and biology, we said, okay, do it. Mm -hmm. I'd been reading people like Malcolm Gladwell and how many times students may change majors, mm -hmm. things were shifting right. in terms of the liberal arts education and the like. So I figured, you know, God bless me, make the investment. If you have to take a gap year after you find it, you don't want to do this, fine. But then it got into her DNA. Mm. And so she excelled at that. She's finishing up med school to become a pediatrician. She'll be leaving next spring for wherever residency will take her. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't have been more proud of how serious she's been with her academic career. And I said to her in the beginning, what you and I know we did not have in, as a part of our trajectory. I said, Houston, the Lord has blessed me to make sure mm -hmm. that you don't have anything else to do in this space in your life mm -hmm. but study. Amen. Take that serious. Mm -hmm. I had to work. Mm -hmm. I had to earn money and divide my time. Mm -hmm. And I probably could have been a much deeper scholar mm -hmm. with a bigger reservoir of knowledge if I didn't have to compete with having to work. Yes. Take this time. I will supply everything mm -hmm. other than the effort for your academic pursuits. Mm -hmm. I'll make that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You spend this, you can, you can pay bills the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a professional employee the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. You take this time and do nothing but study. Mm -hmm. And to the degree that you honor that, you get a free ride. Mm -hmm. To the degree that you are not a faithful steward of that, then we come back and we renegotiate. <laughs> and, you know, there are so many young people who are probably watching this saying, I wish I had somebody to give me a free ride. When Biden came out with this uh, forgiveness of 10000 or twenty if you got a Pell Grant, uh, there are those, even myself, Say, oh Lord, let that happen because I'm still paying for some of my education. But to be able to do that for your daughter is so big and huge. Yeah. She's starting out on the on on the on the level she needs to be where she can make a name for herself and do the things that she needs to do. Right. And and it has to be at the expense, yeah. you know, of parents, right? Yeah, 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 your sacrifice. When when you bear people into this world, mm -hmm. you gotta make a sacrifice. Absolutely. And I don't think we I don't think we uh, zero in on that enough. We don't. We don't help parents and communities uh -huh. to understand that raising the next generation mm -hmm. calls for sacrifice. You know, you said something during the time you was preaching the, uh, the other night, um, and I want to just recapitulate it. And, and you said there, are, well, I, I'm, I'm going to phrase it my way, but you, was, you were talking about how there are people who are big in the church. I mean, they, they're churchy. Mm -hmm. Every service, they're there, but spend no time or the appropriate time mm -hmm. with their children. Mm -hmm. The house is falling apart because they are going to be the super saint. Mm -hmm. And when you said that, I was just so, I was like, amen. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that we try to do here at Easy Family, and I do it as an example with my family first. My daughter is, is doing exceptionally well, mm -hmm. but we should never become so churchy that we lose out on the things God has given us. Right, right. You know, and when you said that, Yes, that hurts some churches because some churches believe, come to church, yeah. pay your tithing. But th they don't think about the fact that you got to take care home. You can't tell me that that honors God. Mm. You can't tell me that neglecting any relationship mm. in your family honors God. I am a strong proponent as a pastor 
if I'm in a counseling session mm -hmm. and a husband or a wife sees the church as competition, oh, yeah. I don't blame their lens and interpretation. Mm -hmm. I blame the other person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to I want to start questioning, querying and encouraging the other person. What about your involvement has created this lens in your spouse? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had everything. You cannot be at it's like a person who goes to the gym from eight o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night and think they're going to grow muscles. Muscles grow mm -hmm. not from the lifting, they grow from the resting. Yeah. It's why the Bible has a Sabbath, yeah. right? Yeah. As a requirement. It's That's why great. in the Psalms there's what they call that Selah. It's the breath between mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the vocalization. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, what did God do in his own creation? He rested. Yes. Right? Yes. So you can't, I don't think you can use the church as an excuse to avoid building something strong at home. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the church should be used as an excuse to escape mm -hmm. things that are going on at home. I think the church should be a supplement mm -hmm. and a place for instruction and equipment to help you be better in the other spaces where God also holds you accountable. Yes. I, I would be terrible for me, and, I've, and you've said the same thing, which is one of the reasons why I'm knitted to you as a brother. It would be horrible mm -hmm. for us to have been excellent pastors mm -hmm. and our kids be dysfunctional. Yes. To me, that'd be poor stewardship and ministry. That's right. And, 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 and there are people who give excuse to that. Absolutely. But that is totally unacceptable. Oh, yeah. You, the church needed me. Not no, to that degree. No, no. Let me tell you something. And, and th this is really more about you today, but le let me just be very honest with you. My daughter, when God finally gave me that miracle, mm -hmm. um, I made it. There is nothing she will want that I will not work to make happen Absolutely. as long as she do her job. Absolutely. Her job is to be a good student, mm -hmm. to love God. And if you talk to her, to, to, even tonight when, 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 you come, when she comes, you can ask her, what, what are, the, what are the, 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 um, uh, uh, the principles of your family? Mm -hmm. And she'll say, God, mm -hmm. family, education. Yeah, absolutely. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. And we try our best. And that's what I love about your comments with um, uh, Mount Ar Ararat. Um, they allowed her to be herself. Mm -hmm. And that's important for your daughter. That's important for you. Absolutely. Where she didn't have to be some person who was this perfect child yep. and they had to be at every service and things of that nature. And I don't think Rosa would have permitted that with us. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly, Isaiah Fear has been exactly the same way. Yeah. We're grateful for that. What I want to do is I'm going to go to a commercial break and then I want to talk about that hard moment in your life okay. or even, even th th that moment when you, you had to make some decisions. You know, because that, that this conversation has turned in two different ways, and I'm grateful for it. But I want to just do that when we come back. Okay. We'll be right back. New guests, new conversations, new stories every Sunday at 11 a.m. Grab your cup of coffee and tune in with Dr. Curry for our weekly episodes of Coffee with Curry. Join us at 9 a.m. on YouTube every Sunday by typing E Zion Fair Baptist Church. Oh my God, help me today. Which means, which means every storm is a school, every trial is a teacher. Every experience is an education, and every difficulty is development. You may we are Wilmington's most exciting church. And we're back. Great conversation. For those of you who are just tuning in, you really need to go to YouTube and look at the whole video, the whole interview. Uh, I wanted to just talk about gratitude and being grateful, which we really kind of, that is what we're talking about. But the whole, I would call it counseling session that we just had here is very much important. I hope you get an opportunity to just look at the whole interview if you're just tuning in. D Dr. Curtis, you know, your success is strong, okay? When I look at you, I, I, I look at a brother who can preach. I, I know you're not looking for these accolades, but you can preach. You, you, you can have a bad night and end up ending so well that we forget the two mistakes you may have made somewhere else. And, and I'm not saying that as if I've heard any of your mistakes, but 
you 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 you're a successful husband. You are outstanding, and your daughter came down here the two times when you did revivals here from when she was at uh, Villanova. Um, you're a successful husband. Your your congregation. I remember when we were in Pittsburgh for our fraternity a district meeting, and um, they were trying to hurt and get back to church. You had sent your praise team over to help us out. You, the church loves you. There, what we learn from our heart, the hard places in our lives. Mm -hmm. Was there a moment in your life when Tom was just, it was just hard for you and you had to make some decisions? Well, I mean, all, none of us escape without having a multiplicity of them. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to really think about which one I want to share. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's instructive for people to know it comes spontaneously, perpetually, intentionally. Okay, good. good. Uh, and the reason I say that is because Evans Crawford at Howard said when listening to us preach as seminary students, he would never just say it was an excellent sermon, but he would never say it was a bad one. What he would say is, great work, it needs blood. Okay. And we would ask him, of course, to further expound. And he said only life could create the kind of conviction, passion, and authenticity that that sermon needs to go from being just a great structured sermon mm -hmm. to being a life-changing message, Wow! right? Okay. And that comes with time and experience. So there have been pivotal moments mm -hmm. that have been extremely hard. I think one of the hardest moments that almost made me exit ministry mm -hmm. was the result of doing a favor for a very, very close friend of mine. It was related to an automobile. He wanted me really to babysit an exquisite automobile for three years because opportunities were being given to folk whose skin doesn't look like ours. Mm -hmm. And it was at very little cost to me, mm -hmm. some, but very little cost to me. And the misinterpretation of my outside of air rack community mm -hmm. caused a firestorm uh, that literally broke my heart. I remember that. To hear to hear comments mm -hmm. that were antithetical to everything I believe about ministry, mm -hmm. to listen to the vicious things mm -hmm. that people could say at a point in my ministry where the body of work should have proven that mm -hmm. there had always been more sacrifice than there had been reward, mm -hmm. right? And that the integrity of the way the ministry was being handled in terms of finances and its work with the community and its staffing and its investment in people should have been clear indications mm -hmm. that the kind of interpretation that was coming with the vitriolic language could not have been true. And I mean, it broke me Yeah. to the extent that I said, I am too smart to do this work anymore. Mm. I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to train myself for law. I'm going to spend the second half of my life practicing law and then I'm going to dissipate into retirement. And Claude Alexander mm -hmm. from University Park in Charlotte mm -hmm. called me. We had been talking through the entire thing. He introduced me to Richard Rohr, an author, mm -hmm. who had written a book entitled Falling Upward. And Rohr says, God orchestrates a death, not literally, mm -hmm. but a death of character, losing someone close to you, a job, a sickness, to emerge you to a second half of life. Because in the evolution of lived experience, the first half, you are building for your identity. Mm -hmm. And the second half, God's want, God wants to use you for his identity. Oh, wow. And it was that, it was reading that book mm -hmm. that made me anchor back into ministry again, but differently. Mm -hmm. It was then that I was not worried about preserving a reputation. Mm -hmm. I'd always wanted to be, you know, the, the professional um, with the good name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves you. Mm -hmm. And you get to a point in life where you experience things like that, that you decide that is impossible to hold over an mm -hmm. entire body of work. Mm -hmm. That you have to trust that it's God's church, it's God's ministry. For people who are not in ministry, wherever you are professionally, it's God's sphere. And he is using it not only for you, he's using it for the expansion of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And to what degree can, as John says, you decrease 
so that his glory might increase, mm -hmm. right? So I've had several of those kind of experiences and every one of them have contributed mm. to the building of a better personality, mm -hmm. spirit and disposition than would have emerged had I not gone through them. Yeah. Okay. You say and I was just going to say, that's yeah. why Paul says we're hard pressed on every side, yes. yet not in despair. Right. Yeah. You know, I often share with those of us here in Wilmington, that um, God is never concerned about our comfort. Right. He's only concerned about our character. Mm -hmm. And when I sat here, and I remember, I don't, I don't do a lot of social media, but you going through your experience helped me to solidify the fact I don't want to deal with social media. Mm -hmm. Now we, our church, we, 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 I preach and do all the things I got to do with it, but I don't, I don't, I don't do nothing personal. Mm -hmm. Because this is what I, some of the takeaways I took away from it. Where were the friends mm -hmm. who knew you? Mm -hmm. uh, um, where were they? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was getting a little beside myself because I'm saying people marry our success mm -hmm. and quickly divorce our failure. Absolutely. That wasn't a failure moment. I don't care. It, it didn't matter to me whether it was given to you, you paid for it. Mm -hmm. You have built, had built at that point a strong reputation we we knew Bill. We we knew it, we, and for the only voices to be heard mm -hmm. were the dissenters. Mm -hmm. Was totally egregious. Yeah, and I and I, you know you, you become bitter only when you carry that expectation mm -hmm. further than the realization okay. that people are always first predisposed to self preservation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a that's the psychological mm -hmm. thing that mm -hmm. comes. It's that's it's therapeutic, right? Mm -hmm. People always it's the baby cries for milk, mm -hmm. and no matter whether you are in the middle of a banquet, mm -hmm. the baby doesn't care. That's right because the baby is for self preservation, mm -hmm. right? But I think that goes with us through adulthood too. Uh, it it was easier to enjoy a person's success than to risk mm -hmm. when a person finds themselves in the wilderness. As they say in the church, or as the preacher usually say, now here's the shallow of the message. Right. You survived. Yep. yep. You made and, it. and it's one of the reasons though, that I am the first, I attempt to be the first to call people mm -hmm. when they find themselves going through. Yeah. I don't want to know your business. Mm -hmm. I can't even rescue you, mm -hmm. but I want you to know the ministry of presence is available to you because I know what isolation feels like. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I don't want you to have to experience that. Yeah. You know, th thank God for, for you, Pastor. And, and uh, I'm grateful that I'm your friend, okay? And never been a time when we've called and you've not been there. So, 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 so hats off to you and, and, and continue to do the great work that you do. But before I let you go, I'm interested in knowing Let's get a celebratory moment, a moment that you will ever, you will forever cherish in the ministry. I, I'll, I'll, again, this can go on so many levels. I'll offer the one that was professional. Okay. I remember the very first time standing on the platform at Hampton Ministers Conference. Oh, uh, yeah. Knowing that right after this choir finishes, uh -huh. I have to stand and preach. Uh -huh. I am 39 years old uh -huh. and I'm the youngest person to ever be elected to the office. Yeah. And for anybody that doesn't know Hampton, it is like for ecumenical clergy, it's the Mecca. Yes, sir. You can have seminary presidents and professors sitting up in the nosebleed. There's a high expectation. And I'll never forget finishing the sermon and sitting down and incarnating the scripture that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember what I said, mm -hmm. but I remember the impact mm -hmm. that it had. And I could not have been more internally gratified that God covers all human mistakes. Mm -hmm. He covers all human frailties mm -hmm. for the preservation of his word. Mm. That's one of the highest moments. You know, that's professional. Personal, I think it is looking into the eyes of that woman as she was pushing my daughter out. Mm. And the respect level I had, my, my, my wife was sick for seven out of the nine months mm -hmm. to the extent that she would go to work, come home, and I would hook her up to the IV. I cleaned her pail. Mm -hmm. I washed her body. Mm -hmm. 
and watched her sacrifice to birth my daughter. And then I was privileged to be in the delivery room mm -hmm. and to watch her push life out. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a moment I will never in life forget. And it is, I think, what knits every married person spouse to spouse mm. because she's looking in my eyes as she's pushing i'm looking at her going you are the strongest person i know on the planet mm -hmm. and out of that came a miracle wow excellent well for those of you who are watching i we need more time because what a what a, a, a joy having uh, dr bill curtis with us today um for those of you who are watching listen at the end of the day it's about being grateful and even the answers that he gave to me today was his way of sharing gratitude for those who impact his life. Make sure that's happening in your life. Dr. Kurz, before we let you go, if there's anything you want to share with some person uh, that may be watching us today, you are a model of success, but you, were, well, you weren't always there. But if there's anything you would like to share with a, with a person who's listening today, you have that moment. Well, I would quickly say your life is only a network of relationships. Yes. So who you are in relationship with is what ends up making you who you are. Mm -hmm. And people like you who contribute to my life and the ebb and flow that mm -hmm. just goes with regular friendship is what creates a certain mindset, a mindset, a certain level of expectation, a pursuit of excellence, a lens for possibilities. So for me, it's knowing people like you and so many others who bring to ministry and bring to life the kind of philosophies and ideologies and ethic and praxis that makes you want to be a better person. Mm -hmm. So nurture your relationships well, because they can make or break you. Absolutely. We'll be right back. Please bow your heads. And I'm just grateful that we can all be here in this moment. I'm thankful for my family and that they care about me. We're another year older. We've been through a lot of trauma. No matter what color we are, no matter what uniform we got on, you guys are my family. Nothing more important than family today. It's good to be together. Come Let's enjoy. Together, right Over me. All I can say is wow, wow, wow. For those of you who had an opportunity to hear the whole interview, you know that the hand of God is powerful and it's mighty. To be able to see a brother who have come from the hood in essence, dad and mom split up um, and he made it. He talked about the black church and how the black church was very instrumental in his life. The black college experience, the aunt who looked out for him, the woman he married, well, well as they say, his, his teenage sweetheart and then produced a child that was their miracle who is doing phenomenal things. There is no question that God is real and we're grateful to God for what he has done and is doing. It was during the interview when he talked about the breaking moment or the, the hard moment, not the breaking, but the hard moment. But there was some breaking there too, but it was the hard moment. Wherever you are, whatever is happening in your life, it is not to destroy you. It's really to build you. And that's the place. And that's what I'm taking away from our interview today with Dr. Uh, Curtis that, that he was able to make it. He's able to stand on the stage of success because he survived whatever life threw. God put the right people in the right place to make things happen for him. And I hope and trust that today's uh, telecast, today's opportunity of this conversation will have really helped you and have caused you to be able to think twice on what's going on. One of the things he did while he was here in our church for the revival that's talked about the church, we need to start investing in that ministry for for mental illness uh the saints are committing suicide i mean it's just so much going on and after COVID, it, it's just been really uh, we're out there and we don't know what's going on so for every person who's listening to me please make sure we're taking care of ourselves this is the end of our month for the whole thanksgiving uh, season but it is not the end of thanksgiving Please note that. And we thank you so very much for taking the time to chat with us today, to hear our conversation. It was a joy. And anytime I can get a chance to bring Brother, brother Pastor uh, Dr. Curtis back here, I'm always going to make it happen because he is a true good friend. Till the next time we get together, may the Lord God bless you real good. Mm -hmm.